Hello and welcome to another article from the Academy of Historical Fencing. Today I'm going to be talking about the different materials that we use for our training swords. And this is a topic that comes up um, quite a lot, all the time, and has done for years. By the material we mean, do we use wood or um, synthetic or aluminium or steel? There's a few other options as well. Is what do we use and why? And there's still a lot of conflicting sort of um, belief on this and there are different schools around the world doing different things. So I'm going to give you an overview of what we've used over the years, um, what we use now and why we use them. Now, quite a few years ago, the simple answer was there was only steel. So you bought something like, um, well, this is a Regeni Sabre, but like this, basically a steel sword, which is roughly of the weight and feel of an original. And obviously, if you have a sword that is of the weight and feel of an original, it will largely hit like the original. Obviously it's not sharp, so that is an advantage, but in terms of blunt force trauma and potentially rigidity as well, you're talking about being similar to an original sword. Now that obviously has some advantages if, uh, of that it's realistic and disadvantages in that it's going to hit largely like the real sword. So over the years, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, why would you use anything but steel? Why not just go for the real thing? Well, it's not the real thing, it's blunted steel which is a compromise in itself, because a blunt sword does not feel on, con on contact with another sword, like a sharp sword does, and does have some limitations of safety, as well as cost. So there is no perfect solution for a training sword. And I would say anybody that tells you you should only ever use one particular type, well, I would suggest they need to get off their high horse, because there's so many great training, training swords out there, so many options to expand what you're doing. Um, both in terms of different weapon types as well as different experiences in the fight. So, a quick overview, that's how things started. I mean, not obviously with a Regeni Sabre, but with uh, blunt steel swords. A lot of the sort of swords years ago were just reenactment blunts, which often are very rigid and not particularly great in terms of handling characteristics either. But blunt swords, they can still have their place. Depends what sword you're looking at. Blunt long swords have gone out of favour with a lot of people now in, in, in favour of um, fedders or fetish verts, which um, are things like this. This is my Regeni, rather well used um, feather, and um, they're really doing very well in terms of popularity. A feather is characterised by its um, thin, blunt, safe blade that typically has quite a broad shilt, which is this section you see here, um, and usually flex quite well, better than a blunt sword will, and usually are lighter and a bit safer than a blunt sword. And I do say usually because feathers can range an awful lot in terms of uh, weight handling and, uh, and the way they're built. Some of them can be full weight and full handling characteristics of a sharp sword, whilst being blunt. And um, others are built to be a bit safer. So you see a lot of people have moved on to using feathers. Um, with things like the sabres, this effectively is a blunt version of an original blade, just with, uh, a, buff with a, a roll tip on it. And for something like Sabre, I think that works incredibly well. This is about 800 grams or 850 grams, something like that, so it represents the original sword quite well, and it doesn't have the immense cutting power of, say, or in terms of blunt force trauma, of a 1.8 kilo sort of monster that you might expect of some big two-handed swords. So I think for a one-handed sword like this, a blunt sword is ideal. Also, we're not doing as much thrust work with a sword like this most of the time. It's a, um, more focused on the, the cut, so we don't need as much flexibility. It's not like a rapier where we're constantly using thrust work, where if you were being hit by this as much as you would do a rapier, it's really going to start to uh, get uncomfortable. But it's safe enough, and um, it's realistic. So I think for something like a uh, military sabre, um, or possibly even some smaller arming swords, something like that. Blunt is ideal. For rapiers, and obviously I've been a rapier instructor longer than I have instructed on anything else, and I would say steel is great for that, especially great because rapiers don't have the cutting power of a lot of things like a sabre, so they become safer. So you can have a full weight um, rapier, which you can use at pretty much full contact levels quite safely. So for rapiers, and for a sabre like this, excellent, I would say, go for full weight blunt blades, just with a little bit of flexibility. Now, don't take that um, to mean all sabres, because there are plenty of sabres that are awfully heavy. If you look to some cavalry sabres, some hussar sabres, 
and even just earlier parts of the period um, sabers, you're talking about things that can weigh 1.2, 1.3 kilos or, or even more occasionally. So you're talking about real monsters. But in terms of representing, say, British pattern sabers, excellent, blended really good. So, steel. What do I think about steel? Well, when we started our club, in fact, we've been training since uh, 1995, and we started the AHF and actually started teaching people in 2006. For all those years, and the first few years of the AHF, we only had steel. It was the only option we had, blunt steel. And it is nice in the hand. It feels better in binds than any other material really does. Um, however, it is expensive. It does have some safety limitations. Even with some of the best kit that's available today, things have got a lot better, certainly with equipment, is you still have some, um, have to be a bit careful and there are a few limitations and there are a few safety risks. As well as the fact that I really encourage people to have an eclectic sort of approach to the fencing and study a range of weapons. I think it's a poor martial artist who really only understands how to use and encounter one other style or one other weapon. Um, I really think you should be able to pick up a great range of weapons and be able to use them very successfully and fight against those weapons with whatever you have to hand. So I believe you should go with a range of weapons. Uh, I would recommend that you at least have one steel sword and do spar with it, providing you've got the safety gear and are happy to do so. So yes, blunt steel is a recommendation. It's not the be all and end all. I think you should have other things as well, but yes, have some blunt steel. And the feathers, I think they work pretty well. I think some feathers have got a little bit on the large side to the level that I'm not even sure what they're, what they're representing anymore. And they are being used in potentially an overly sportive manner. But that's a, a topic for another day. Feathers, they are a good thing, often. And on to um, what are the types of things they have been. Well, this is a shinai which is um, a Japanese training sword, which is, um, in fact, incredibly well designed. It's pieces of bamboo that are bound together, and on impact, they make a lot of sound, which of course is great for videos as well. Um, but they take out all the impacts. It's a nice flexible wood, it's very, very strong, and the way it's all bound together, it takes so much of the impact out of it to the level that they hit really, really light, incredibly light. You could really go into um, a lot of your sparring with just a simple pair of um, padded uh, sort of, or, 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 or lightly protected gloves and a mask, and you'd be safe for most things with a, with a shinai. It's um, a very light hitting training sword, and in many ways it represents uh, a European sword better than it does the katana that it's trying to represent, for two reasons really. One, because it's straight, um, which is like a lot of long swords that people are training for, as opposed to the katanas which are lightly curved. And also because its overall dimensions represent a um, longsword really quite well. It does represent something like a, um, a typical longsword, something like an Albion Lectonau, really, really well. And it's a little bit long for most katana. So in that regard, it worked quite well. The limitations of it are that, one, it has no definable edges. You've got this string to actually tell that's the back edge. But in the fight, it's very, very hard to tell and it obviously handles the same on all sides, as opposed to the characteristics that we get in Longsword or, or any other European sword of having a back edge, a true edge, and flats. And that is relevant to the fight, um, very relevant in fact. So you've got no definable edges, which is slightly annoying, and no flexibility on that either. Again, on the flat plane on a lot of European swords, you'd expect a bit more flex, and that will affect how you use it as well. Um, they also don't flex much on the thrust. I have, a, I have seen some impressive photos and videos where they have been forced to flex, but they will hit very hard. You take that to the throat or the, uh, the sternum, it really hits hard on the thrust. And with European swords, we want to do a lot of thrust work, even with European longsword. The European longsword was not about just bashing people away with the comparatively dull edges, as people would have you believe. Um, so we want to do a lot of thrust work. They're not great for that. They don't have discernible edges. They don't have an actual um, quillen or cross guard as European swords would typically have. People did add them over time and people use sort of wood and uh, heat from old plastic to make those, so that could be modified. Um, and the overall weight, they're incredibly light, incredibly light. And again, people did modify them, they put roof and lead around here, um, a bit like you'd have a shilt on a, on a feather. So they could be improved upon, but ultimately they bounce very badly on impact. They don't have discernible edges, they're not good on the thrust, so they're not a great training sword. 
What they have in their favour is they hit very, very light on the cut and they're very, very cheap to buy and readily available. So they do have that in their favour. And we did use them as a, for a few years as um, beginner swords because, again, in the early days of the AHF, all we really had access to were very expensive steel training swords. So we used the Shinai completely unmodified as just a basic entry level um, trainer. I don't think that's necessary anymore for the simple reason that we've now got um, a range of quality uh, synthetic training swords like this from the Night Shot. Now, I'm not saying this is a perfect training sword at all, although I'm not even sure what a perfect training sword is half the time because there are pluses and minuses to all of them. But a Night Shot training sword like this has discernible edges, it actually looks and feels like a European sword, it flexes nicely on the thrust, uh, and it doesn't have the bounce issues on the edge um, that the Shinai does. It still has some bounce, it bounces a bit more than steel, but nothing like the Shinai does. The disadvantages to this over Shinai is it does hit a lot harder on the edge, but a lot lighter on the thrust. Um, so that's a slight disadvantage. And all that means is that you need slightly better gloves and you want some joint protection because you take a high power impact from this on your elbow or your kneecap, and it will do some damage, as opposed to the Shinai, which it's going to hurt, but it won't do the damage that this hard plastic does. Um, overall, I'd say there's no point in the Shinai anymore. If you want a cheap, quite safe, uh, entry-level weapon, get a Night Shop uh, synthetic sword. That's just the answer to it. So I wouldn't bother with the Shinai anymore. The other thing to consider, of course, is uh, other types of wood. It's, over the years, it's very traditional uh, sort of to use um, wooden uh, wasters, if you like, they're called. Uh, are there any point in using those anymore? I would say no. The reason they were used historically is because, again, comparatively safe. Well, this is comparatively safe. Very, very cheap. Well, again, these synthetics are cheaper than most wooden swords these days, so that doesn't really count. Are they any more realistic, the wood, than using this? In that you can get them a bit more rigid, but again, you go to the black fence and stuff and you've got the rigidity there. And wood has some awful issues in terms of handling, it doesn't tend to handle particularly well, and it chips really badly and tends to crack and break and even potentially become quite dangerous when it splinters. So I don't really see the point in using wood anymore. I have done, and I don't see the point anymore. We've got so many better options. Of course, in terms of other wood, it was very common to use um, a dowel, if you like, on a, some kind of leather basket uh, called single stick, and that was a, quite a safe training option, particularly in the 19th century. And you can use things like rattan or bamboo for that, as well as a range of hardwoods. But if you use things like a uh, rattan or, or a bamboo, you've got something that's got a bit of flex and a bit of play in it. So again, it can hit lighter. That has a few advantages over um, some of the other options. But again, I would far rather use this. I've used all kinds of different woods for basket hilts, and I would say this is better. Um, it's cheaper, it's simpler to, work to actually just purchase and it handles pretty damn well. And any disadvantages it have, has, it has plenty of advantages over using that um, wood. So there's the wood option. What else do we have? Well, uh, aluminium. That is aluminium, not aluminium. We are British, remember? Um, what do I think of aluminium? Well, for a few years, people started to use it particularly for things like the Meza, the Lang's Meza or Gross Meza. Why? Because it's incredibly cheap to buy, cheap to work with, and you could purchase these at the time for about £35, which was an incredibly cheap way of getting a training weapon, which handles close to steel. Um, on the binds, I've heard people complain over and over that they don't get the feel through aluminium that you do with steel. I've never found that, but I think that you can feel through aluminium perfectly well. I don't think that's an issue. In terms of when they bind on each other, in some regards I find that aluminium is more realistic on binds than steel. And the reason for that is, is because it's soft. And it burrs really badly, really easily. And as a result, when they impact, they have that kind of slightly damaging stickiness when you get edge on edge. If you get two sharp swords and the edges connect, you will take a little bit of edge damage and they will stick slightly to one another. And that's characteristic that you do not get with blunt training swords. You only get it when you've got something that has a very thin edge um, or easily damageable like that. So in some regards, 
These did actually have a similar effect on binding actions to sharp on sharp steel, which was quite nice. But of course, the problem with that is, yes, they are taking this damage all the time and you're having to do constant repairs on them. If you want to use them for drills, you won't take so much damage and that's fine. But again, if you want to use something for drills, why not just get synthetic? It's still cheap and it worked really, really well. The um, other consideration with aluminium is it's not flexible. Um, if it's actually substantial enough to, to represent the sword anyway. If it is flexible, it'll just bend and stay in place. Um, so yeah, on the thrust these hit like hell. On the cut, they hit rather hard as well. There's just no play in them whatsoever. But they were cheap and they were much closer to, to actually sharp steel than most other things out there at the time. But would I recommend aluminium swords anymore? Well, not really. There are cheaper and cheaper steel options available these days. You can go to people like Peter Rigeni and get quite affordable blunts or feathers, depending on what you want. Um, and if you want something that represents steel a lot cheaper, you can get a range of synthetics from uh, the Night Shop or for more realistic, realistic options, Black Fencer and uh, Purple Heart Armory in the US. So that was aluminium. Uh, I haven't used these for years now. We did use them for a long time, but I don't think they've really got much of a place in HEMA at the moment. Okay, so I think that takes us through all the options. In terms of uh, what we use in the club commonly today, we've ditched aluminium, we've ditched shinai, we've ditched most blunt steel swords, except things like um, some side swords, rapiers, um, sabers, and things like that. Whereas um, the majority of things we're using, like long swords um, and the earlier pattern curved sabers and things like that, we're using uh, synthetic. So if you see what we do in the club, we probably have um, about a 50-50 usage of steel, which will be a mix of blunt and feather, depending on what type it is, and synthetic swords, which, if you want the very safe, easy option night shot basket hilt, still very, very good. A lot safer to use on terms of impact damage than uh, Black Fencer and Purple Heart. If you want the realistic uh, synthetic, go Black Fencer if you're in Europe or um, consider um, uh, Purple Heart in the US, although again you can get Black Fencer in the US as well now. So that's what I recommend. Uh, the last option, which I haven't got here today, is the padded swords, um, which are made by Spez. Uh, there's a few other companies that make them as well. Uh, they look horrible really but they do have a place i don't think i've actually put any videos up of them but we do use them in the club from time to time and they've got hardcore and then they're padded on the outside they're a bit like a larp sword and what place do they have well the useful thing with those is you can just reduce your kit down completely now what we've done with instructors and more advanced students so i wouldn't recommend this to all but with more advanced students is you can use them with nothing at all, no fencing mask, no gloves, nothing. And that will teach you some valuable lessons about protecting your head. The fencing mask these days is very tough. If you put a mask protector on, it's even tougher again. And people have a tendency to just not worry too much about their head, and they really should. And if you go into a fight with one of these foam sabers, which can hit pretty hard, not enough to do serious damage, although you should be concerned about your eyes and your teeth, of course, um, you will quickly learn to really worry about protecting your head. So the padded spez swords, like the sabers for example, I think they do have a valuable place. They're quite an interesting training tool. Not one that you need to use often, but they do have a, they can teach some valuable lessons, if you like. So that's my recommendation, is blunt steel and feathers are very, very useful. They are, in many ways, the most realistic in terms of the overall feel on contact in the fight. But when you're talking about realism, there's more to realism than just edge on edge, because if you wanted realism, you would use sharps, and there are very limited things you can do with sharps without killing one another. If you then look to safer options like the um, uh, synthetics, is they allow sometimes a greater range of activity. Um, some actions that would be a little bit dangerous with steel become more realistic with this, and they're still pretty close to using a steel sword. These sort of um, sabers, for example, are incredibly close to using steel. I interchangeably, in one night, go from using Regeni Steel Sabre to uh, Black Fencer. They represent a slightly different period Sabre, but even so, they're pretty damn realistic, these things. 
So that's what my, my recommendation is. Synthetic, which way, whichever one you go for, is excellent. It's a good beginner tool, it's a good advanced tool, it's good for expanding your range of weaponry. You want at least one, or ideally a few, steel, feather, or um, blunts for a range of other weapons. And consider things like padded, just as a few um, other lessons on top, if you like. So this is a triangulation of different training tools. I wouldn't get stuck with one of them. If you only use steel, um, uh, blunt or, or steel fedder, I don't think you can actually learn all the lessons you really need to learn. And if you only use synthetic, you're not going to know how steel handles. So I'd recommend a bit of a mix. If you're just starting out, I definitely recommend you go with something a bit safer to begin with. It's cheaper and there's less protective equipment to worry about. So that's my recommendation. Thanks for watching.